Number 10, Man Bat. The Man Bat is not always a villain of Batman's. He has been known to sometimes be an ally as well. But when Dr. Kirk Langstrom is in his Man Bat form, he is always horrifying. So horrifying that the closest thing we got to him was in one of Batman's nightmares from Batman v Superman in the DCEU. However, this wasn't really specified to be man bad specifically. Dr. Langstrom aimed to create a serum to help the deaf and blind, but accidentally made a serum that also transformed anyone who used it into a giant bat like creature. Both he and his wife suffer from its effects at one point, becoming the man bat and she bat, respectively. It would be cool to see a horror style Batman film featuring these two monstrous and sometimes villainous characters. Number 9, Solomon Grundy. While he's appeared in lots of animated films, Solomon Grundy has yet to make his debut in the live action. World of the DCEU. This could be because of his monstrous appearance. Solomon Grundy is a zombie like villain who sometimes ends up as a hero depending on the circumstances. He has a Frankenstein type vibe to him as well, which likely makes him too monster like for the likes of the DCEU. Although there are so many horror inspired characters and villains in DC comics that would be cool to see if that genre made its way more into the films. Horror DC, I would watch those movies. <laughs> Number 8. Hugo Strange Hugo Strange has a place in the television series Gotham where he is played by B.D. Wong, and is depicted as the chief of psychiatry at Arkham Asylum. But we have yet to see the insane mad scientist make an appearance in the DC Extended Universe. Because he is often closely tied these days to Arkham Asylum both in the comics and in the Batman video games, it would be kind of hard to introduce this madman who has a tendency to experiment on patients and transform them into monsters into the DCEU without first introducing the famed Asylum. Hugo is a formidable and frightening Batman foe, not just because of how insane he is, but because of how brilliant he is too. It's a perfect plan. With this machine, I can imagine Batman to be anyone I choose. And these fools will pay a fortune for it. He was even able to use his smarts and deductive reasoning to uncover Batman's true identity. Number 7, Kull Borson. Born the older brother of Odin, Kull Borson, aka Serpent, is the god of fear in the Asgardian world. He possesses all the conventional attributes of an Asgardian god. However, as the son of war, many of these attributes are significantly better than those possessed by the majority of his race. He possesses enough superhuman strength to shatter Captain America's shield with his bare hands, has the ability to manipulate magic as he's able to teletransport, revive the dead, and transform himself into a giant serpent. And as the god of fear, he could consume the fear of other people to empower himself, making him stronger and even younger in the process. During the Fear Yourself storyline, Cull created and gathered his worthy in order to spread chaos across the entire world. This group being made up of Juggernaut as Kurth, Breaker of Stone, Hulk as Null, Breaker of Worlds, Atuma as Nurkod, Breaker of Oceans, Titania as Skurn, Breaker of Men, Grey Gargo as Mock, Breaker of Faith, Absorbing Man as Grey Thoth, Breaker of Wills, and Thing as Angrier, Breaker of Souls. Thor was eventually able to kill him in the storyline after some intense battles, but not without losing his own life in the process. Obviously though, both characters do come back to life it just a little bit later on. However, Cull meets his permanent end in 2019's Thor Volume 5, number 13. Want to know what led up to that point? Well, check out this whole story for yourself, starting with 2011's Fear Itself, number one. Number 6, Cassandra Nova. This powerful telepath is certainly not well known among general audiences and has actually never been introduced in any of the movies whatsoever. Cassandra Nova is essentially a member of a parasitic race of psychic beings and attaches herself to Charles Xavier while he's still in the womb. She absorbed the darkest parts of his mind and basically became Charles' twin sister. Though the doctors pronounce her stillborn, Cassandra in fact survived and spent the next few decades as a growing mass of cells in a sewer wall, building a new body for herself and planning her revenge on her brother. Since she copied the DNA of Charles, this means that she is able to access the full spectrum of his powers, making her one of, if not the strongest telepath, because this means she has all the powers of Charles Xavier, meaning the ones that he has had and the ones that he might receive in the future as a result of any latent mutations. Overall, she is a dangerous enemy of the X-Men, having made an army of sentinels murder over 16 million mutants on the island of Genosha, and that by itself is a reason she is on this list today. Check her out for yourself in 2001's new X-Men number 144, and let me know your thoughts on her in the comments below. 
Number four, Mad Jim Jaspers. Mentioned briefly at the beginning of our list when I was talking about the Fury, Mad Jim Jaspers is not a super well-known villain, but just because they're not well-known doesn't mean that they're not scary. He has a truly terrifying power, which is the ability to shift and twist reality however he sees fit, making him without a doubt one of the most powerful beings in the Marvel Universe, having powers beyond the cosmic entities. Couple that with the fact that he's, well, mad, and you get something out of a David Lynch nightmare that you do not want to mess with. Jaspers regularly twists the world into the nightmare hellscape he believes reality to be. And this, as you can imagine, leads to some imaginative and horrifying scenarios. According to Merlin, the 616 Jaspers is just way too powerful, stating this version of Jaspers is too powerful, too dangerous. His 238 counterpart could at least be halted, even if it meant destroying his entire continuum. This one, however, is not so easily containable, and if he can't be defeated, then the Omniverse shall fall into chaos and a new hostile god shall play dice with the matter. Now, if you want to know more about the the character, then check him out in his first appearance in 1983's Daredevil, number 9. Number 3, Dollmaker. Dollmaker has a horrific origin, which makes it hard to introduce him without going full horror film mode. When Barton Mathis was young, he would go camping with his father, who it turns out was a serial killer. While camping, Barton would not only witness his father kill people, but also commit acts of cannibalism. He also saw his father killed when apprehended by the police. Years later, Mathis would grow up to be a gifted but deranged surgeon who was obsessed with using his victim's body parts to craft dolls. He wears a mask made of human skin and was the one who helped Joker to remove his face during the lead up to the death of the family storyline. Number 2, a Black Lantern Corps. One of the most terrifying villain groups both appearance wise and in terms of their threat level is the Black Lantern Corps. Of course, this would be a hard supervillain group to introduce being that we'd likely need Green Lanterns to be on the scene to help explain well just who the Black Lantern Corps are and why we should care about them. After all, you can't defeat the Black Lantern Corps anyways without the entire emotional spectrum of lanterns assembled to help create that white lantern power. This threat might also just be too huge and horrific to make an appearance due to the sheer size of their numbers. In the Blackest Night storyline, they were like an overwhelmingly sized zombie apocalypse level of threat, killing heroes and resurrecting them to join their deadly ranks. Number 1. Batman Who Laughs It might be a little too confusing for the DCEU to introduce the Batman Who Laughs, as that would mean they'd likely have to involve the dark multiverse somewhere in their films, and the dark multiverse is likely too dark even for DC to make that happen on the big screen. The Batman Who Laughs is an alternate version of Batman who was infected by Joker Venom after being pushed too far by the villain, causing him to lash out and kill the Joker, snapping his neck. This caused Batman to become infected, driving him insane, and causing him to take down his own world's Justice League and kill his own Bat family, save for Damian Wayne, who he convinced to join him. He's one of the biggest bads in DC's current storylines. Number 10, Court of Owls. The Court of Owls is a villainous and powerful group who seek to exert and wield political influence in order to shape the world as they choose. They are enemies of Batman and often use their group of highly skilled assassins known as Talons to eliminate those who stand in their way. These assassins are also immortal to an extent, as they are often imbued with a metallic alloy known as Electrum, which has astounding healing properties and can even reanimate and resurrect dead tissue. The Court of Owls was created by Greg Capullo and Scott Snyder. First appearing as adversaries to Bruce Wayne in the 2011 Batman series at issue number 2. Number 9. Granny Goodness. Her name might not make her sound terrifying, but Granny Goodness is not as sweet as her name makes her out to be. She became a trainer of Darkseid's soldiers after impressing him when she herself was selected to train and become one of his elite hounds. Fans of Kingsman may find the story of how she was trained very familiar. During her training regimen, she was given a dog to train herself, who stayed with her and progressed alongside her. After bonding with the animal whom she named Mercy, she was later instructed to kill it. Goodness refused and instead killed her trainer. When Darkseid asked her why she had done this, she revealed that Mercy was worth more than her trainer had been to Darkseid, as Goodness had trained the dog to not only be loyal to her, but to Darkseid above her. Darkseid tested the theory by ordering Mercy to kill Goodness, and was impressed when he found the dog actually obeyed. Goodness of course was forced to kill Mercy, but this act would inspire Darkseid to shape and use Granny Goodness as his most reliable trainer and recruiter of soldiers, with Goodness being responsible for brainwashing those she trained, and becoming the most loyal and fearless members of Darkseid. Darkseid's army. 
Number 8. Black Flash In the comics, Black Flash acts as a symbol of death and also sometimes as literal death for the speedsters. You see, the former Flashes and past speedsters have all been too fast for regular death to touch them. And so it seems instead they have their own version. Enter the Black Flash. The Black Flash draws power from the speed force like many of the other speedsters we've seen. This being is able to freeze time, but only for those who do not possess potent super speed powers. It resembles death in appearance, looking like a corpse of a zombified version of the Flash. While Black Flash has appeared in the Arrowverse, this speed force entity has yet to appear in the DCEU. Number 7. Mr. Mixie Piz Yidalik. So, Mr. Mixie might not be horrifying to look at. He's kind of silly looking, truth be told. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be scared of him. He has more power than you can possibly imagine. And in fact, anything that he can imagine can come to pass, should he will it. The only limit to his reality altering powers are the limitations of his own imagination. Like Batman's Joker, he has at times claimed to be the ultimate Superman foe. In one story to prove this, he even killed all of Superman's enemies and allies just to prove how evil he was. Mr. Mixie also forced Superman to kill him as well, forcing Superman to break his own moral code. Ooh, talk about being on Joker's terrifying level of ultimate villainy. Oh, I don't feel so good. But it's still worth it. Number 6. James Gordon Jr. He might not be on Mr. Mixie's level in terms of his power set, but James Gordon Jr. is one terrifying and creepy villain. As his name implies, he is related to Commissioner Gordon and is in fact his son. Surprisingly, James is not like his dad and grows up instead to become a psychotic serial killer, exhibiting early warning signs from a young age that there is something very wrong with him. He used to pick apart and torture animals and was suspected as being involved in the disappearance of one of Barbara's friends, Bess Keller. Though, nothing was ever proven. He ends up returning to Gotham and is revealed to be a full out serial killer who enjoys torturing his victims to death in Black Mirror. Later on, he ends up joining the Suicide Squad and becomes the team's strategy analyzer. Man, I would not want to work with James Gordon Jr. on the Suicide Squad. I'd be like, Ugh. No thanks. Number 5. Papa Midnight Papa Midnight is a villain to John Constantine for the most part. Sometimes he's an ally, but more often he's not, as the man is obsessed with power and is a pretty bad dude. Papa Midnight grew up in Trenchtown, Jamaica. Born Linton Midnight, from a young age he became inspired by tales of dark magic that his parents had told him. He betrayed a group of slaves, conning them into believing that they would be protected if they rebelled, which led to their deaths, and later went on to sell his sister's soul into demon slavery, so that he could achieve more power for himself through using her soul as a barter chip, selling it to the demons of hell. Ooh. Considering how violent and insidious Papa Midnight is, we likely won't be seeing him in the DCEU, although he has managed to make an appearance in the CW Arrowverse, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> Number 4. Crib How does one even make a villain like Crib in the DCEU, just from a visual standpoint? Like, ooh, that'd be a lot of effects, I think. Crib is a member of the Sinestro Corps. She is described as being an alien hag and is 100% something out of a nightmare. Lots of Baba Yaga vibes here as well. However, instead of being associated with eating children, as Baba Yaga sometimes is, Crib's purpose is to kidnap the newly born children of Green Lanterns who are also parents. Crib will even go to the lengths of giving her pregnant victims four cesareans in order to secure their children. Ugh. She keeps the kidnapped newborns in her hunchback, which looks like a creepy bone crib, and promptly kills the parents of any children whom she has taken away. What's more disturbing is it's never explained why Crib has this compulsion. It's just something she feels inspired to do. I guess she doesn't think Green Lanterns make for great parents? She was like, I'll be a way better parent to these babies with my weird bone crib. Super qualified. Number 3. Dr. Destiny Speaking of Sandman, I want to talk in particular about another horrific villain who appeared there, although this one also exists as a horror and supervillain within the direct DC Comics universe as well. There he wielded a device he'd invented called the Materiopticon. This device was later retconned to be Morpheus's dream stone, which his mother gave him, when Dr. D appeared in Sandman. Dr. Destiny was hypnotized by the Justice League to prevent him from dreaming and becoming too powerful. As a result, he was driven insane and ended up in Arkham Asylum, wasting away, becoming a skeletal version of himself. When he escaped, he wreaked havoc at an all night 24 hours diner where he tortured the patrons and staff before Dream finally caught up with him. Thank goodness, cause that issue, woo, it's crazy.
Number 2 Professor Pig Professor Pig's real name is Laszlo Valentin. He is a former spiral agent who went insane and became obsessed with curing people of their individualism in order to perfect them. When the crime syndicate temporarily took over Earth, Gotham City was overtaken by the criminals who ruled in Batman's absence. Pig himself used the hospital as his own HQ and worked from there, kidnapping civilians, sedating them, and transforming them with strange cosmetic and mutilating procedures, using involuntary patients to create his own horrific Dolatron army. He was created by Grant Morrison and Andy Kubert and also first appeared in 2011's Batman series. Number 1 Jane Doe Jane Doe is a serial killer who served time at Arkham Asylum. She appears to not have any skin of her own, appearing to be covered in exposed muscle tissue. Instead, she covets the skin and lives of others. While she doesn't appear to have any specific superpowers, it has been implied that she might be possible of shape shifting. She often gets to know her victims before killing them and adopting their identities, sometimes even wearing their preserved skin as a suit, instead of simply using makeup to disguise herself. For example, I could be Jane Doe right now and you wouldn't even know. That's how good she is at it. Oh my goodness. Number 10, Uranus. While Thanos didn't outwardly appear to be nervous or afraid around his great uncle Uranus in the recent Eternals comic series, or at least in the one shot issue that sort of tied into Eternals, Eternals the Heretic, I'm not fully convinced that this was actually true. In fact, I might even think that Thanos was perhaps bluffing. This is because Uranus is known to be even more of a killer than his great nephew. Even if it didn't appear as though Thanos was affected by this knowledge, we already know from other experiences that Thanos does not like to have his purpose undermined in this way. He likes to be the best and greatest agent of death and Uranus, if not locked up, compete with him for that title. Which likely means that Thanos, if Uranus were fully unleashed, would be afraid and intimidated by him, probably seeking to destroy him eventually. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love this video, if you love when we talk about Thanos, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 9, Mephisto. While in Infinity Gauntlet, it seems as though Thanos is actually playing Mephisto for a fool, making him in essence behave like a servant to him. In reality, it kind of seems more likely that Mephisto, in awe of Thanos' power, is actually along for the ride and looking for ways to manipulate him. This wouldn't be the first time Mephisto would do something like this in Thanos' life either. It is also implied in issue number 38 of the current Avengers run that Mephisto actually manipulated Thanos in his past as well, possibly even having a hand in encouraging Kid Thanos to join up with the Masters of Evil and take on the prehistoric Avengers. Also, Mephisto, or the collection of Mephistos, could later make a deal with them. Who knows? I personally think, while Thanos might not see the threat that Mephisto is as a villain, that Thanos could fear and perhaps in the future will fear him when he realizes just how much Mephisto may have been manipulating him this whole time. After all, it was actually Mephisto in Infinity Gauntlet that kind of first helped plant the idea of Thanos snapping. Seriously, go back and read that issue, you'll see what I'm talking about. Number 8, Ultron. While Thanos may not have seen this coming in the What If Disney Plus streaming animated series episode, if he had, he likely would have been wise enough to have actually been afraid of Ultron. Ultron here is nuts. Here Ultron ends up becoming all powerful after Thanos arrives on an already decimated Earth. Because in this reality, Ultron actually won. Thanos having the rest of the Infinity Stones at this point does not prove powerful enough to stop this alternate Ultron, who actually kills him just using the Mind Stone alone and takes the rest of the Infinity Stones for himself. Number 7, Mandrak the Dark Monitor. Mandrak is a pretty confusing entity, but also a fairly scary one. Mandrak was once, or is, depending on what you believe, Dax Novu. And Dax Novu was once part of the Monitor. Following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, the injuries the Monitor had suffered caused it to splinter somewhat, dividing its body and creating other, smaller monitors. Dax Novu was one of these monitors. He eventually realized that the monitors were parasitic beings who were feeding on the energies of of the multiverse, slowly consuming and destroying it. He informed the other monitors of this, but was shunned for attempting to share his realization. Dax then became corrupted, turning into a dark monitor known as Mandrak. While we might eventually see the monitor and anti-monitor make their way into the DCEU films, it's unlikely we'll see this dark monitor pop up anytime soon. 
Number 6. Anti-Monitor Speaking of monitors, we should also quickly touch on another scary and powerful one, sort of THE scary and powerful one, the Anti-Monitor. Anti-Monitor is a supremely powerful villain who threatened the very existence of the multiverse during the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. He controlled the antimatter universe, and is hell bent on ensuring the destruction of all things. So much so that even after Anti-Monitor is defeated, Necron ended up trapping the Anti-Monitor's body, and as it was later revealed in Blackest Night, using it as a source of power for the Black Central Power Battery. While we might get a sort of crisis inspired storyline in the DCEU with all different alternate universes and timelines from DC and television and film being acknowledged, it's more likely that they'll go the Flashpoint route as opposed to the Crisis on Infinite Earths route. Number 5. Dr. Death The most recent incarnation of Dr. Death from Prime Earth was only around for 5 issues. So it's not just his horrific story and appearance that will likely bar him from appearing in the DCEU, it's also just that he isn't really one of the main villains. He doesn't have as much clout. However, in the few issues we did see him in, he proved to be a terrifying villain and foe. Dr. Carl Helfern was a brilliant scientist working for Wayne Enterprises on a serum that would strengthen bones, causing them to become more durable and Instead of breaking when under stress. However, his failed attempts, combined with other mental trauma and strain, caused him to go insane. He killed his scientific team, injecting them with a failed version of the serum that caused their bones to grow until they were ripped apart. Number 4. The Corinthian The Corinthian isn't specifically from DC directly itself, but is from an imprint of theirs that used to be known as Vertigo. Well, it's still known as Vertigo, but it no longer exists. It was discontinued, and instead, we got Black Label, which is also an amazing line, but everyone was obviously still sad to see Vertigo go. One of Vertigo's most famous series was Sandman, which also featured some of DC's characters who made cameos throughout. The Corinthian, however, was not one of these, but is a character unique to the world of Sandman. While we are getting a Netflix series for Sandman in 2021, I also think it would be super cool to get some darker toned DC films. Among them, it would be cool to get some Sandman or at least a Sandman film. Although the Corinthian might be too monstrous to actually make an appearance, even if we did get a Sandman film. He is one of the nightmares that Dream made. At one point, he escapes the dreaming and ventures out in the world, where he becomes a serial killer who pulls out and eats his victim's eyes. He himself has mouths where his eyes should be and usually wears sunglasses to disguise his monstrous appearance. Ugh. Eating eyes. It allows him to see everything that you've seen, which is, uh gross still. No, it's still gross. Number 2. The Many Angled Ones What is a fate worse than death for Thanos? How about a fate where life and creation win? Where death is defeated so all that is left is untamed, uncontrolled, wild life. That is basically what the Cancerverse is. Although it doesn't have the most appealing name, the Cancerverse is actually known as such thanks to the fact that it came into existence after the original Captain Marvel of an alternate world made a deal with the many angled ones to rid him of his cancer basically by defeating death. However, without death to keep it in check, life became twisted and corrupted by how rampant it was. And the many angled ones were also now able to enter that reality, corrupting it further as they were basically eldritch gods. At one point, the Cancerverse plans to take over the whole multiverse, invading various other universes and sitting on the edge of reality, threatening to bleed into other worlds. Fortunately, Thanos returns to life and ends Ends up manipulating Captain Marvel, basically into killing him in the Thanos Imperative. With Marvel making an exception to the rule that nothing can die in their universe for Thanos, because he's like, "You are so annoying. I just you gotta go." As such, because this Thanos is actually of Earth 616, his version of death is able to appear in the Cancerverse when he dies and allows it to be defeated, basically. But even though this works to get to this point, it takes a lot of courage for Thanos, who is actually afraid of joining in the fight against the Cancer. Verse initially, due to the absence of death in that world, which makes sense. I mean, he's kind of all about death, so I'd be pretty nervous about that too. Number one, Thane. Thane is Thanos' son, and he definitely feared him because he literally returned to Earth to try and hunt Thane down and destroy him as a result of Thane's potential power surmounting his own. He's afraid that Thane will basically rise up and overtake him and basically end up being a better Thanos, I think. But in the end, this wasn't something that Thanos had to be particularly afraid of, it turned out. Even after Thane became empowered with the Phoenix Force, Thanos still managed to defeat him. And this was also at a point when Thanos himself seemed to be dying at this time. 
time in the comics. Thane ended up being stripped of the Phoenix Force and ended up sentenced to suffering a hell like existence in the God Quarry for the rest of his life. Or, you know, at least until some writer remembers, oh yeah, he's still down in that God Quarry and decides to get him out of there. Thane was also an inhuman, and his powers are actually perfect for someone who is known to be. Thanos' son. He had a death touch ability that while untamed could kill anyone within a certain radius. And he could also trap people in a state of living death through encasing them in amber, which sounds actually worse than dying to me. Number 10, Doomsday. I have to just assume that Batman is afraid of Doomsday. And there are multiple reasons I believe this. For starters, anytime I've seen Batman even attempt to get involved in a fight with Doomsday, he is never throwing punches. He is either staying the heck out of the way, maybe only acting as a distraction, or he is powered up by some serious magical artifacts. Secondly, Batman is incredibly smart. He knows how hard it is for someone to take down Superman. And the fact that Doomsday is one of the few characters who was able to do it, and with such brutality, there is no way Batman is not intimidated by this monster. I refuse to believe it. Honestly, my favorite point of proof is seeing what Ben Affleck's Batman does in Batman vs Superman. Say what you want about that movie, but Batman jumping around the battlefield just trying his best to stay out of the way? Hilarious. Number 8, Zaz. Victor Zaz has a character trait that a few others on this list possess. He's just completely and utterly insane. Zaz scares Batman for one main reason. Whenever he is not locked up, it's almost guaranteed that lives will come to an end. Which just ups the ante because every escape of this killer becomes a race against the clock for Batman. He needs to bring him down fast before he adds another scar to his body. Every single one of those scars signifies a failure for Batman. Zaz is a man with absolutely no form of pity or morals, and he will never stop unless he passes away, but we know Batman will never do that. In an alternate story, Injustice, Zaz is even responsible for the passing of Alfred Pennyworth, which was not supposed to happen, but because Zaz is Zaz, it did. Number 7, Kang the Conqueror. Kang the Conqueror is someone most people might underestimate in the world of comics. This is because he kinda has a ridiculous look in terms of his character design, and probably also because he's known for floating around in kinda like an invisible space chair. It's not the easiest look <laughs> to adapt to a modern setting and have it feel, you know, anything but ridiculous. It just kind of, it's a, it's a look. However, Kang is also a time traveling villain and the master of time. We have seen both Thanos and Kang reveal that each is intimidated at times by the other. And I know some people are probably going to be like, but Amanda, what about the time Kang was like, I literally have been avoiding you in like every timeline. Well, there's another alternate reality where something different happens, okay? While Thanos might pack more of a physical punch, Kang could also probably just erase Thanos from existence if he really wanted to. And in an alternate alternate reality at least, he has defeated Thanos using his power over time to basically turn him to dust. So that's also happened. Really it could go either way. I'm very interested to see if there will be any interaction between these characters in the MCU. I know Thanos is gone, but what if he came back? I don't know. Number 6, Death. Not really a villain per se, though some could see her as such. Death is still definitely an antagonist at the very least. She is the embodiment of death, and I would say that Thanos both respects and fears her during his time pining after her. He is afraid of being rejected by her, that's for sure. Thanos has a complex relationship with death, being an agent of death as someone who also happens to be in love with it and the feminine entity who embodies it. Thanos at one point pleaded with Death to stay with him after she left him in essence at the altar, following their fight in an alternate universe where King Thanos, as he had become, had pretty much destroyed all life and existence for her. But you know, still not good enough, Thanos. You gotta earn it. You gotta destroy all life, not almost all. Number 5, Magus. Adam Warlock and Thanos have been at each other's throats for years in the comics. But with Adam Warlock being a hero, Thanos would wouldn't be particularly afraid of him, I'd say. In fact, the two have also teamed up together when they've needed to, so they fought each other, but they've also worked together before. Chiefly against the man they are both afraid of, Adam Warlock's evil counterpart, his evil version, Magus, who actually is like the dark side of his soul made manifest. Magus was actually created to be the champion of life, in contrast to Thanos, who is the champion of death. And as such, the two have been sworn enemies since Magus' creation. He is meant to oppose Thanos, which he has attempted to do multiple times to varying success. At one point, he demonstrated that he was an even match for Thanos when he got his hands on the Infinity Gauntlet, attempting to use it to bend and shape reality to his own whim. Didn't work out in the end, but hey, you know, he tried. 
right. Number four, Doctor Doom. Well, really, God Emperor Doom, but still. Thanos also wasn't really intimidated by this version of Doom, but he should have been. Doom might seem like just a Terran with a big brain and some magic tricks in comparison to Thanos being a cosmic tyrant, but Doom is not to be trifled with, especially when he wields the powers of the Beyonder. Thanos attempted to fight Doom without much fear, and Doom responded by literally obliterating him, turning him to dust and bones with one mighty punch. And you might be wondering if this was some alternate warped Thanos, but no, it wasn't really. This was Thanos of the Black Cabal who had preserved himself along with his teammates in a life raft so they weren't altered at all during the creation of Doom's battle world in Secret Wars. Now granted, yes, Doom was augmented in terms of his power, but still, if Thanos remembered this moment, I'm sure he'd at least have a bit of fear when facing Doom in the future, because that's pretty wild. Number two, Bane. His name says it all, as Bane has been the the Bane of Batman on multiple occasions. The Bane we saw in the Dark Knight Rises movie was fantastic and he absolutely instilled fear in Batman, but the comic version of that same story goes to a whole other level. With his master plan being even more well thought out and damaging to Batman, he unleashed Arkham Asylum on Gotham, putting Batman on the ropes as he has to chase down all the escaped criminals. Bane studied Batman. He utilizes his own weaknesses and completely destroys destroys Batman, breaking his back in one of the most infamous comic book moments ever. More recently though, Bane brought Batman even lower than when he broke his spine because he broke Bruce's heart by snapping the neck of Alfred Pennyworth. Any battle Batman has fought against Bane has been with the help of his allies and that's because Batman knows that he can't take on Bane alone. Number one, the Joker. I think if there is one person who scares Batman more than anyone, it's gotta be the Joker. They've had such a long and complex history with each other and I think because of that and the Joker's obsession with the bat, Joker knows all the ways to mess with Batman and he's constantly coming up with new ones. He will go after anyone to get at Batman and he will go through anyone just for the fun of it. He's unpredictable. Batman never knows for sure where he will strike and what he will do unless the Joker wants Batman to know. Everything is a game, a game that he knows the rules to. The other thing about Joker is that he would never actually take the Dark Knight's life. In fact, I feel like he would probably destroy anyone who tries to. This just makes him more terrifying as he simply wants to be a constant cause of fear and anxiety for the Dark Knight, and he is. Number 10. Vermin. Edward Whelan from Earth 616 had a pretty average childhood aside from his abusive father, which is actually what led him to the streets and crime. Now it's not exactly known when, but at some point he got the attention of Baron Zemo and was subjected to many tests that gave him various rat-like traits and abilities. Aside from the obvious rat-like appearances, his strength, stamina, speed, and durability were boosted to superhuman levels and he also gained the ability to communicate with and command rats that are up to two miles away. After gaining these powers, he was sent out to end Captain America, however he ended up being overpowered by Cap and taken back to S.H.I.E.L.D. for interrogation. He managed to escape fairly quickly though and since then he has been a pretty big thorn in both Captain America and Spider-Man's sides. However, they have actually used him to their advantage sometimes as Spidey once used him as bait for Kraven the Hunter. Whelan since his introduction has been a part of the Hoods gang and the New Revengers so he has definitely been in his fair share of crazy fights and done some terrible things like the time he almost straight up murdered Spider-Man and would have succeeded if he wasn't interrupted. The reason I think he's too scary for the MCU to bring in is because because he not only looks utterly terrifying, but thanks to his genetic alterations, his mental capabilities are at subhuman levels, meaning he pretty much works on primal instincts alone. I mean, sure he's still able to talk, but his reasoning skills are not the best, so he's pretty ruthless. And let's not forget that he also likes to eat people. Check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1982's Captain America number 270, and let me know if you agree with me. Number 8, Nightmare. This supervillain is basically the Freddy Krueger of the Marvel Universe, and if just knowing that isn't scary enough for you, then buckle up. Classified as a class 3 demon able to capture a sleeping person's astral form, Nightmare's whole thing is he's able to bring their form into his realm to torture them, and the effects of that can last for hours, even after they wake up. Nightmare has been a major pain for many heroes in the Marvel Universe, including Peter Parker and the Hulk, and none more so than Doctor Strange. That Poor guy seems to get the biggest and baddest baddies out there, but I guess that's the price you pay when you're the most powerful. 
powerful sorcerer. Strange has made it clear that he makes a regular habit of casting a protection spell before he goes to sleep, so he does not have to go toe to toe with this villain. Later in this character's run, we see Nightmare growing stronger by the minute, able to access human minds through the American dream alone. And he caused these people to go on a violent rampage until he was finally stopped by Captain America and S.H.I.E.L.D. Skip ahead a little bit more and we actually see the death of this character up against Loki, in which the trickster god used one of Iron Man's automated cars to just straight up flatten Nightmare. So, hey, at least we know he can be killed, right? What makes him so scary to me and definitely too scary for the MCU is he's literally the boogeyman. He's capable of wreaking havoc at any given time. His ability to terrorize the mind and attract his victims is in a never ending horror makes him uniquely scary and I doubt lovable Disney would ever want to cause nightmares in their viewers. Now there is a new Doctor Strange coming out in 2022 though so maybe we'll get to see this villain or maybe we'll get a mention of them. For now check him out in his first appearance in 1963's Strange Tales number 10. Number 7, Thomas Wayne Batman. Other versions of Batman always have the potential to be a scary thought for our Batman, or anyone really. But when that version of Batman is Bruce Wayne's own father who completely destroys him emotionally, teams up with Bane, and is trying to stop Batman being Batman so he can have a normal life, it's an incredibly interesting idea for a character honestly. But with all the daddy issues Batman has, for his alternate reality father to be so twisted and brutal has got to be a terrifying thought. But what did Thomas do that was so bad? Well, let me tell you. Alongside Bane, he ruined Batman and Catwoman's wedding, causing her to leave him at the altar, nearly had Batman send Mr. Freeze to the afterlife for a crime he did not commit, kidnapped Damian Wayne, hired the KG Beast to take out Dick Grayson, he had Bane put Alfred Pennyworth in the ground, then Thomas incapacitated Bruce with fear toxin and kidnapped him. He dug up the coffin of Martha Wayne, wishing to use the Lazarus Pit to resurrect Martha so that they could all be a happy family again. He went more than a little overboard is what I'm saying. Number Six, the Batman Who Laughs. Another version of Batman, only this time it's basically the ultimate evil version of himself. A jokerized Bruce Wayne. He is just absolutely awful. He has all the smarts and skill of Batman himself, but the completely bonkers unpredictability of Joker. And this combo causes the Batman Who Laughs to become one of the biggest threats to the entire multiverse. Now, being a jokerized Bruce Wayne, he has a few differences to the man himself. He's thinner and faster but physically weaker. Unfortunately, physicality in battle with this guy doesn't really matter. He's got backup in the form of his Dark Knights, and he has backup plans on top of backup plans as any Batman worth his salt would have. This guy put his consciousness into a Batman with the power of Dr. Manhattan and destroyed Perpetua, the first creator of the multiverse and the mother of the Monitor, Anti-Monitor, and the World Forger. Number 4, Scarecrow. With Scarecrow, fear is the name of the game. I don't believe Batman is actually scared of Scarecrow himself, but Scarecrow has used his fear toxin to debilitate and send the Dark Knight running on multiple occasions, and that makes him a unique foe that puts Batman in a position he doesn't often find himself in. Batman is a physical powerhouse with a mind that is exceedingly sharp, but his mind is also partially his biggest weakness because he has some serious psychological issues, and Scarecrow's whole shtick is manipulating that kind of thing. When Scarecrow pops up on the scene, the Dark Knight knows that something terrifying is coming his way. Number 3, The Maker. Now, unlike his Earth 616 counterpart, Reed Richards is about 20 years younger, born into a completely normal family, and uh, god, what was it? Oh yeah, he's insane. Now, I'll try not to spoil too much of the story for you because I really think it deserves a read, but I will do my best to give you just the basics. Following an explosion that left Richards presumably dead, the Fantastic Four mourned his loss, but in reality, he's actually alive and well, and he actually set off the explosion himself and was responsible for a ton of other attacks around the city. Convinced that he knows how the world should be run from now on, he is willing to do whatever he thinks is right, regardless of the consequences. Thankfully, he is stopped by a group of heroes, and he is flung into the negative zone. But it didn't take him too long to get back, though, and he easily took over most of Europe. Fast forward a little bit, and we see him form the Dark Ultimates, but they were quickly defeated by the power of the Infinity Stones. Teaming up with Cabal of Earth-616, Richards was able to manipulate the Ultimates into prematurely attacking the Earth. And do I got you interested in the character? Good. I'll leave the rest of the story for you to read for yourself. What makes the Maker so terrifying is that he is so intelligent that there is really no way of defeating him. And since he has the ability to literally stretch his brain to make himself even smarter, he is always 10 steps ahead of you no matter what you do and what you think. Of course, we don't even have the regular Mr. Fantastic in the MCU yet, so even if they have been considering integrating this character, this character's introduction is definitely far off. 
Give a story a read for yourself, starting with 2004's Ultimate Fantastic Four, number one, or feel free to just skip ahead to when he is the maker by taking a look at 2011's Ultimate Comics, Ultimates, number one. Number two, the skinless man. If you were ever wondering why they called Wolverine Weapon X, well, here's your answer. It's not an X, it's actually the Roman numeral for 10. Now with that in mind, meet weapon number three, the skinless man. Harry Pyre used to be a barrister during the Cold War and he was actually very good at his job thanks to his mutant power elastic and multi-sensory skin. Designated Weapon 3 by the Weapons Plus program that augmented his strength and powers, Pizer went on to do some pretty terrible things, and all of that finally caught up to him when Phantom X shot him, stole his skin, and left him for dead. Now with no skin, Pizer took revenge on Phantom X by cutting off his face, and was later recruited into the new Brotherhood of Evil Mutants while he was on the run from that. Once again though, everything seems to catch up to him because in 2013's Uncanny X-Force number 34, he meets an untimely end, and he's not really been seen since. I could go into all the other horrific stuff this guy has done in the comics appearances, but do I really need to? It should be plainly obvious that there will never be an MCU version of the skinless man out there. He has no skin, and his whole thing is literally putting you in a similar predicament as him. That just seems to me like you've got a formula for a character that will forever be stuck in the pages of a comic book. I also understand that he is prominent in the X-Men universe, which is not necessarily the MCU, but it's fine. I'm definitely not far off when I say that there is no way they would use this character even if they had the rights to him. Check out his story for yourself in his first full appearance in 2012's Uncanny X-Force number 21. And finally, number one, we have Arcade. Nobody really knows who or what Arcade was before his life of crime. He has given so many different accounts over the years with no evidence to prove any of them. The one that seems the most true is that he killed his father when he was 21 in order to acquire massive amounts of money, and he discovered that he really liked killing, so he became an assassin. However, he soon got really bored with that and decided to use his wealth to construct a death-themed amusement park to kill people. As a skilled killer, Arcade has been tasked with killing many heroes over the years such as Spider-Man, Ghost Rider, and many X-Men as well. But all of his attempts have ended in failure. On his 29th birthday, he learned that he was a huge laughing stock in the villain community, and this made him realize that what he'd been doing is no longer a game, and that winning from this point on is everything. Using his genius level intellect and his vast fortune, he constructed a new murder land and trapped 16 teen heroes in it for a month, toying with them and prodding them. However, they were eventually freed, and Arcade was last seen tied to the front of the shield helicarrier as a form of torture for everything that he had done. What makes him terrifying to me is that he's all about mind games and toying with people, which basically makes him the Marvel equivalent of Saw. He knows exactly what to do and say to get people to gang up against each other, and he has the knowledge and resources to execute any plan. That is way too much power for one villain to have, especially a movie villain, so I feel like we won't get to see this character on the big screen anytime soon. Number 10, The Fury. Generally depicted as an enemy of Captain Britain and the X-Men, The Fury is a deadly android built by the reality-manipulating psychic Mad Jim Jaspers of the parallel timeline of Earth-238 to destroy all superhumans but himself. Since it's not a living being, it doesn't possess any superpowers. However, it's ridiculously strong, can generate lethal energy blasts, is capable of adapting to any situation, and can regenerate its mechanical body at will. Most of The Fury's enemies on Earth-238 were based on British comic book characters from the 1950s to the 1960s. 70s. After succeeding in its mission, the Fury was deactivated until Captain Britain and his elf sidekick Jackdaw were sent to Earth 238 by the Captain's mythic mentor Merlin. The status crew, enforcers working for the country's oppressive regime, reactivate the Fury and send it to kill the hero, and it murdered Jackdaw and then killed Captain Britain. After a little bit, it traveled to Earth 616 and continued killing many of Captain Britain's allies until it was eventually taken down and buried in the cave system of Captain Britain's mansion, where it absorbed the circuitry of the computer and repaired itself. There's a bit more to its story, but hey, I don't want to spoil it all for you guys, so give it a read for yourself, starting with 1982's Marvel Super Heroes UK, number 387. Number 9, Sugar Man. One of the most terrifying looking villains on our list today is Sugar Man, the villain with a terrifyingly powerful tongue, size and mass alteration abilities, and highly advanced regeneration ability. Originally, he ran the human work camps in the Pacific Northwest and was a geneticist with a lab around Niagara Falls, where he regularly tormented his captives. Magneto needed a mutant with chrono variant powers, aka time traveling powers, in order to go back in time to restore reality's proper order before Charles Xavier's death. And Ileana Rasputin was revealed to be one of the few around, so Colossus and Generation Next were sent to retreat. 
retrieve her. Sugar Man held up pretty well against them, only almost dying like three times. He eventually hitched a ride to the Apocalypse Citadel and was transported from his native Earth of 295 to Earth 616 where he operated with Genosha to help the Magistrates create a mutant captive army that could take over the world. So not only is he scary looking, he is also scary smart. Can't imagine them sticking him into any X-Men movie, let alone an MCU movie anytime soon, so in the meantime, check him out in comic form starting with his first appearance in 1995's Generation Next, number two. Number 8, Super Giant. Although the other members of the Black Order made an appearance in the MCU, one member was unfortunately shafted, and that is none other than Super Giant, the mentally unstable omnipath and telepathic parasite who seeks out intellect and devours it. In the comics, Super Giant had absolutely no issues with taking out the Jean Grey school and the X-Men associated with it. Later on, when the Black Order seized Wakanda, Super Giant was left in control of Black Bolt, whom she would mentally order to activate the bombs the Illuminati hid in Wakanda's necropolis. Upon activating the bomb, Super Giant was faced by Maximus, who had the trigger and Max Maximus triggered the bomb, but also used Lockjaw to transport Supergiant along with the bomb to a distant uninhabited planet where she perished in the explosion of the bomb. Although she did later return as a mental projection and even attempted to take over the body of Captain Glory so she could continue wreaking havoc on the world. Thankfully though, she was eventually taken out for good by the Lethal Legion while trying to take over Thor's mind. Check her out for yourself starting with her first appearance in 2013's Infinity, number one. Number 7, Shumagorath. Older than time itself, Shumagorath is essentially Marvel's take on a Lovecraftian eldritch horror. It is an unknown cosmic entity that used to run Earth before we pesky humans came along. So, as you can imagine, Shuma takes offense at this and often comes back to reclaim his old stomping ground. Doctor Strange is more often than not the only one who can actually fight this thing without completely losing his mind in the process, but as cosmic beings are known to do, it can never really be truly killed. It is considered to be the primal power of chaos and the greatest of the old ones, and aside from immeasurable strength, Shumagorath is also capable of creating powerful blasts of mystical energy that can literally wipe out planets. Although its presence is usually unexpected and unwelcome, Doctor Strange did have to summon a small part of it once during Thanos' invasion of Manhattan to wreak havoc on the city and draw attention away from themselves. Outside of our own reality, Shumagorath has invaded many other Earths such as Earth 9411 and 9997. However, it is very rare that they come out on top because there is usually a Doctor Strange or a group of heroes there to put a stop to them. This terrifying villain is a bit too scary for the MCU in my opinion because well, I mean, just take a look at it. It is literally a massive eyeball and tentacles, just like a real Cthulhu vibe going on, and I'm not really a huge fan. We might end up seeing him in Multiverse of Madness, or even in whatever the third movie will be for Doctor Strange. A Lovecraftian Elder God would certainly be a badass final boss for Doctor Strange. Check out Shumagorth for yourself in 1973's Marvel premiere number 10, and let me know in the comments if you think an on-screen version could be on its way. Number 6. Demon Bear. I mean, from the name alone, you can probably guess why this one is scary, but just stay with me, okay? Created by a villain with a cursed knife, Demon Bear is a corrupted Apache bear spirit. He haunts the dreams of Danielle Moonstar of the New Mutants because he was actually made from her parents. In her nightmares, he tells her he killed her parents and that she's next. So, in a way, he's actually linked to her psionic abilities to create illusions, except his illusion is more of a demon. Like a regular old bear, Demon Bear has the vicious tendencies you would expect from a wild animal. However, there is a lot more than meets the eye. Drawing his powers from negative human emotions, Demon Bear can also teleport, transform, and corrupt human souls. He has gone up against other Marvel characters aside from the new mutants including Ghost Rider and Warpath, however, it was actually Psylocke who ultimately drove out the demon and saved the spirit bear within. He actually hangs out by her side as a companion now, so I guess he did get to redeem himself in some way. I think this character is way too scary for the MCU because he is literally an all-powerful bear that is capable of tormenting people. And not to mention he feeds off the negative emotions, so he only grows stronger the more the person doubts their abilities around him. That's just too much for one character, and I really can't see Marvel bringing him in anytime soon. So why not check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1983's New Mutants to tide yourself over until we finally get to see him in all his furry glory. Number 5, Gore the God Butcher. Born on a planet with no name, Gore was taught from the very beginning to always trust the gods. However, they never seemed to answer his prayers. Stricken with grief after the loss of his parents, wife, and son, Gore completely gave up hope and renounced his faith from the gods. However, while wandering the desert, he actually encountered the god Null while he was engaged in battle with another god. With confirmation that the gods are real, Gore was needless to say pretty mad. And when the one god asked for help, Gore actually used a piece of Null symbiote and created the all-black Necrosword to kill it. From then on, he vowed to take vengeance on all the 
gods for ignoring his prayers and thus began his journey as Gore the God Butcher. Wandering around the universe, Gore absorbs the power of every god he comes in contact with, torturing and killing along his warpath. That is until he finally meets the mighty Thor. The God Butcher storyline ranges across eons of time as Gore absorbs the ability to time travel and ends in an epic conclusion against three periods of Thor's life. Young Thor, Avengers Era Thor, and obviously Old King Thor. Now I doubt Gore will ever grace the screen in the MCU because he is just way too powerful. Equipped with the Necro Sword he carries around, he has the capability to literally slay anything that comes his way. If he was introduced much earlier on, he would have been a much bigger threat than Thanos. Also, you know, just a man who's lost his faith and has nothing to lose is definitely not someone you want to mess with. Give his story a read for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 2013's Thor, God of Thunder, number two. Number four, Annihilus. Known as the living death that walks or the lord of the negative zone, Annihilus is an insect-like creature with some truly insane power. He was exposed to an object called the Cosmic Control Rod, which extended his lifespan and gave him his powers. These powers include continuous rebirth, superhuman levels of strength, speed, durability, and stamina, and flight, of course. Obsessed with protecting the rod, he did absolutely everything he could to keep it from everyone else until the Fantastic Four took it away from him. Annihilus has at various times been the ruler of the Negative Zone, controlling its inhabitants via his powerful Cosmic Control Rod. He first encountered the Fantastic Four after Reed Richards discovered how to travel to the Negative Zone from Earth. Over the years, he clashed with the Fantastic Four on many occasions, often with the group foiling his plan to invade Earth. He would later lead an enormous fleet of spaceships from the Negative Zone into the main universe, setting off the Annihilation Wave by destroying a ton of planets. The Armada was opposed by a number of cosmic heroes such as Star-Lord, Drax the Destroyer, and the Silver Surfer, and was thankfully stopped by the cosmic entity Galactus, with Nova killing Annihilus in the process. He was later reborn as an infant in the aftermath of the Annihilus Annihilation storyline, but other than that we have seen Annihilus go up against the likes of many other heroes and he has been a worthy adversary to say the least. Now I doubt we'll see this character in the MCU anytime soon just due to their immense power and ability to literally broadcast intense fear into the others, the likes of which has even been able to shake the Hulk. It's possible that we'll see them later on once more powerful characters such as Nova and Adam Warlock are introduced, but they are too big a threat. Give their story a read for yourself starting with 1968's Fantastic Four Annual number 6. Number 3, Mr. Sinister. Nathaniel Essex is the supervillain commonly associated with the X-Men known as Mr. Sinister. He is an incredibly ruthless and sadistic man who has no problems doing whatever he deems necessary to get what he wants, including, you know, mass murder. Thanks to having his genetics altered by Apocalypse, he was transformed from a regular old human into a superhuman capable of some ridiculous things like shapeshifting, telepathy, telekinesis, concussive blasts, and can't forget that he also has super strength, speed, stamina, durability, and reflexes. Sinister is also a scientific genius with expertise in the field of biology, genetics, cloning, physics, and engineering. The character is a master manipulator and planner with decades of genetic research at his command. He goes to great lengths to preserve his powers and personality through elaborate technological means, such as conditioning certain children to be his quote-unquote host in the event of his future death. Over the course of his time in comics, we have seen him go up against the likes of so many heroes and come out relatively unscathed, and that is why he is so high up on our list today. Check him out for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1987's Uncanny X-Men number 220. Number 2, Chaos King. Amatsu Mikabashi is none other than the Chaos King, the god of evil, chaos, and the stars to the followers of the Shinto religion in Japan. He possessed the conventional abilities of one of the Kami, the order of Japanese deities such as superhuman strength, speed, durability, agility, endurance, and recuperative abilities, as well as high abilities with some form of potent Japanese magic, a brand of sorcery that seems especially effective against the Olympian deities. His physical strength, at least in his main incarnation, is considerably less to that of like Zeus or Izanagi, and is roughly equal to that of an average Kami, but Mikabashi can project energy on a scale at least rivaling that of Zeus and Izanagi as well. Like the Asgardians, the Japanese gods are extremely long-lived but not truly immortal like the Olympians, as they tend to age at an extremely low rate upon reaching adulthood, and are three times denser than normal human beings. During the events of the Chaos War, we catch a glimpse of Chaos King teamed up with Necra and none other than the Grim Reaper and Abomination to fight against the other gods. He even goes as far as unleashing Carrion Crow, Eater of the Dead, to antagonize the revived X-Men members. All in all, he is brutal in terms of methods and isn't too easy on the eyes either, so check them out for yourself, starting with 2006's Thor Blood Oath number 6. 
And number one, the first firmament. At the very beginning of it all, there was only one universe, the first firmament. For a long time, the first firmament was the sole being in creation until its loneliness became unbearable and it decided to create the first life in creation to give itself companions as well as servants, which it eventually came to regret. It created two specific types. Black servants dutifully obeyed and worshipped their creator, and then the multicolored ones had completely different values and desires as they wanted a dynamic, diverse, and continually evolving reality, where being lived, learned, reproduced, aged, and died in order to slowly improve themselves through evolution. Unfortunately for them, when the creations argued with their creator, they were destroyed completely. Now one can only imagine what might happen if an entire universe were to turn evil, but this is the answer to that question, since the first firmament became the evil that many people worry about. Just imagine an emo sentient galaxy that could destroy pretty much anything with just a gesture. Absolutely terrifying and way too much for the MCU. Check it out for yourself in its first full appearance in 2017's Ultimates 2, Volume 2, Number five.